Welcome, everybody, to the Indie Game Lunch Hour. Today we're talking with Rochelle P. about gaming for good, more than just video games. The Indie Game Lunch Hour. Wow, in our special holiday edition of the Indie Game Lunch Hour, where we won't do anything different except for that moment, me mentioning the holidays, uh, we talk with uh, developers in the gaming industry and give game devs the chance to hear stories of breaking in from them, as well as directly ask them questions about their areas of expertise in the second half of each episode. This is an unedited or mostly unedited recording of a weekly event we host on our Discord, so we encourage you to come join us for the next one. It is always Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, and there are links to join us down below. As always, I'm your host, Willem Delventhal, Headmaster of the Indie Game Academy, and the Wizard of Joy! And joining me today is Rochelle P. Rochelle is a UX researcher over at Blizzard, which is a recent development that I'm sure we'll talk about, and a huge advocate for gaming for good. Rochelle, welcome. I'm so excited to chat with you. What are you having for lunch today? Hi, Willem. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's really awesome to get to talk to everybody. Um, well, for lunch today, I'm having a girl lunch, and it's just leftover <laughs> McDonald's french fries and some yogurt. Wait. <laughs> What qualifies a girl <laughs> lunch? Is that what you said? Yeah, so it's like a meme, you know, like girl dinner where it's just random <laughs> snacks and bits and pieces that you, scra nice. you scavenge and stuff your face with. I'm curious that the audience can uh, can can weigh in. I'm curious what a guy lunch is then. Maybe it's just <laughs> it's just meat, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> what is the stereotypical guy lunch? Well, welcome, Rochelle. It's wonderful to have you on. Um, Rochelle is a member of the community uh, and has been around for a little while and recently landed this job at Blizzard, which is extremely exciting. Um, as always, though, I think I would love to hear it more from your lips than from mine. So, Rochelle, I'd love to hear your origin story. Tell us how you broke into games and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, it's been... Um kind of a staple of my whole life career, uh, my whole career that I've done different things and I've pivoted and getting into games was another one of those pivots. I started uh, my career in the military. I was in the Air Force as a linguist, which if anyone wants to talk about linguistics and that kind of thing, we can definitely do that. Um, and that's where I really cut my teeth on research in general. Mm. I I had been to college before, but I didn't finish my first year, and so it was on that job where I really learned how to talk to stakeholders, for example, how to write these very professional reports, and just how to wade through lots and lots of data and produce something on the back end that people could read coherently and make serious decisions uh, from. Um, from there, I... I was able to finish a couple of degrees. I did um, some associates in Spanish, as well as intelligence studies and technologies. And I did my bachelor's in psychology because I had mm. been convinced from a young age that I was gonna help people. And in high school, that's when I became determined to do it through psychology and mental health. So while I was a linguist, um, I also wore a couple of different hats in the military. Um, I was a master resilience trainer. Uh, this was a program in the Air Force, uh, which each of the branches have their own version. Um, but basically, you went through a lot of training um, to be a, a peer counselor, sort of. So you talk to people about resilience, bouncing back from daily stressors, um, providing different tools for people if they didn't have any for coping with these kinds of things. And you were just somebody that people could come to when they had questions or concerns or just needed someone to listen. Um, I also did a couple of psychology internships. Um, and then after the military, I worked at a clinic briefly. And then I did a lot of volunteer work for Take This, which is a really awesome nonprofit that's focused on mental health in the game dev industry. Um, so I did a lot of that. <laughs> and when I was getting out of the military, um, I was thinking about what I wanted to do after. Um, like I just described my whole experience with the mental health care field, I was convinced I was going to go on and do my master's in psychology and get licensed. 
Um, but I had some kind of a strange epiphany that I wanted to really get back to my creative roots and I wanted to still help people, but I wanted to kind of be um, a creator. And I stepped back from the precipice of going into psychology as a licensed clinician, and I decided to do my master's in UX design. And from there, that's when I got really involved in um, making games and doing some freelance UX design and UX research work for um, tiny little indies, indie mm -hmm. studios. And I just loved it. I really love the just the energy when you're creating and you're working on something together. So I was really hooked. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I, I want to do this. I want this. Amen to that. Um, right? <laughs> So I just I just got plugged plugged into a lot of different gaming communities, um, a lot of IGDA groups, and going to GDC was an eye opening event. And just from there, I just started pushing myself into games, um, just making room for myself. That's one thing I've learned um, how to be assertive in that way from the military is hmm. if I don't see myself somewhere, or I don't see representation somewhere, I'm gonna just do it. I'm going to make a way for myself. So that's what this has all been. Huge skill. And, um, <laughs> we could talk the whole episode yeah, about it's, that. Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, but yeah, so it worked. And I work at Blizzard now. And I just started um, in November. So it's still super fresh, guys. Um, but I'm so <laughs> happy to be here. Uh, oh, my gosh. I love working there. Um, all my coworkers are so awesome. And yeah. It's a wonderful first home. Oh, so cool. I there there's a lot uh one of the reasons that I love doing this podcast is because I hear a lot of the same stuff from a lot of people. For instance, the deflection moment where you go, hmm, I thought I was gonna go down this route, but I wanted to be more connected to my creative, uh sort of younger self even, is something mm -hmm. I hear a lot. But then I also always hear parts of this story that are different from uh from person to person. Um for instance, the fact that you came from military. Uh, you mm -hmm. learned to uh, stand up for yourself and you learned to research and understand people and you learned to um, be better at sort of communicating with people. And then you step into psychology thinking that was your path because a lot of that, a lot of those skill sets apply there. And then you realize that, that wasn't quite for you and you stepped into games. That path is not one I think I've really heard before. And it's quite cool and it shows, um, shows the, the mysterious uniqueness of each of us. Um, <laughs> Now that said, I think I, I think I'm gonna be honest here. I don't feel like you gave that Blizzard job the justice <laughs> it deserves. <laughs> you gave me a very cool story, but what people are gonna be most curious about is how do I get a job at Blizzard though? Um, so tell us, how did that happen? Give us a little bit of that background. Oh uh, yeah, for sure. So I, like I said, I was getting plugged into a lot of different gaming communities online and mm. Um, that's been the key uh, for networking, right? And just getting familiar with who's who in the industry. Who are the people doing the things that I admire and I want to do? Um, so I just started following these different groups and finding people. And one of those groups, um, as a researcher, is the IGDA um, User Research Special Interest Group. Um, so joining that community, they have this awesome summit where they talk about so many cool topics in games, user research. Um, there's another person, Celia Hodent. If you don't know her, then you probably will if you're interested in uh, user research. Uh, she's amazing. Um, and so I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in this group with all these different people. I'm learning, I'm observing, I'm soaking in. And I, I'm noticing that there's one person in particular who's really championing accessibility in games uh, with user research especially, and they work at Blizzard. And so I've seen this person in that community a lot. I've seen some of their talks, I've seen some of their papers, I've seen what they've done, and I'm like, that is so cool. This person is making change. Um, that person, um, <laughs> I didn't tell her I was gonna do a shout out, but um, her name is Nikki <laughs> Crenshaw. Um, she is an amazing person, super talented individual, and um, I had just been following her. We'd never formally talked or anything, but on LinkedIn, which is also a really great networking tool if you're not on there seriously, <laughs> um, plus. she made a post of like, oh, my team is looking for a researcher. Apply here. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, there's an opening on her team. I so want in. <laughs> so that was the impetus to make me apply. Um, not only was it a user research role in games, which those are kind of, those are hard to come by because the community mm -hmm. is pretty, it can be com competitive. Game designers um, think was... that they can do that themselves and then <laughs> they don't advocate for UX roles. Yeah, and, and it's it's quite competitive and spread out, right? Geographically, there there can be some openings in London and somewhere in Europe. And then so also the openings in the US is also, it can be small. Um, so that was pretty exciting in and of itself. But the fact that it came from this person who I really admire their work in the field, I was like, oh my gosh, let me just try. Um, <laughs> And that was just a component of believing in myself and <laughs> just being like, you know what? What's the worst that can happen? You know, I get yeah. rejected. So I, I've had a lot of those. Um, yeah. So I applied. <laughs> I applied and um, I was so excited when the recruiter called me back, um, like just a few weeks after I applied, I think. Um, yeah. And then that kind of unleashed this two month interview process um mm -hmm. <laughs> i think it was like five to six interviews <laughs> yep that's amazing so did you so that means this was a cold application right you didn't know celia personally yeah. it doesn't sound like you had a referral it was just an application is that right right and and celia doesn't work there um she's just a user researcher who i had followed and that's how oh, i I'm got sorry, into nikki. the yes yeah nikki was the one yeah i didn't know her personally yes. no yeah. Nope. And so you did not have a referral to get this position. Not at all. <laughs> wow. Okay. So that alone, we could just end the episode actually, if we wanted to, because <laughs> that alone <laughs> is a huge motivational um, piece for anybody who's listening. Um, Amir Satvat, who's the, I've now started calling him mm. the sweetheart of the game industry because he's just like mm -hmm. this super wonderful dude. Um, he had a post a while ago where he crunched the numbers to show that you have a less than a tenth of a percent chance to land a job that you cold apply to, meaning no oh. referral, um, no connections. Uh, you just send an application and that's it. So you mm. were one in, what is a tenth of a percent? Uh, one in a, a million? A hundred thousand? Something like that. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. How's that land wow. for you? <laughs> um... Honestly, wow, <laughs> I'm speechless. Yeah, <laughs> because you know it was um it was a long a time thousand. of a thank you, Gwen. Of a, One in a thousand. Still. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time of applying, and so thinking about those odds, that's it's really it's really beautiful, and I'm really grateful um, because yeah. this couldn't have been the more perfect opportunity for me. Yeah. Now it goes to show you something that I'll often say is uh, you have to be a badass candidate to land jobs. <laughs> so, you know, you did the work and you have the history to showcase that already before you got the role. Um, but still, you know, those really are some incredibly slim odds that you managed to pull through on. That's amazing. Well done. Now, um, I want to get, I want to make sure that we have ample time to talk about the podcast uh, topic of the day, which is gaming for good. Um, this is one that I have long thought about. I had a period of time in my life. Um, I, uh, in my own history, I sold my first game uh, at 15. And it was mm -hmm. mostly an accident. It did not make that much money, but it did make money. Um, and it was sort of this eye opening moment where I realized games could actually be a career. I've been mm -hmm. making games my entire life, something I've always been connected to. If you ask my parents, they would not be at all surprised that I'm a game developer. But I definitely mm -hmm. had, despite all that, a period of time, largely in college, where I didn't think games were the way to go, because I didn't mm -hmm. think they were serious enough. I felt like it was kind of a, a cop-out or escapism. You know, many of the very typical um, uh, statements that you hear from the media and other places about what is wrong with games were bouncing around in my head. Um, gaming for good, in some ways, I think is sort of an answer to that. So I would love, I guess, why don't we start with just an introduction? What What is gaming for good, in your opinion, Rochelle? For sure. Um, in my opinion, um, gaming for good is taking games out of the common context that we typically approach them with, which is entertainment, and applying them into other use cases, um, specifically in ways that are helping people. 
uh, which can be kind of a surprising twist for folks who who aren't so familiar with how games can do that. Um, but as gamers, um, at the most base level, we all know that games, not only are they fun, but for a lot of us, they brought us uh, companionship, right? They brought us friends, relationships. Um, they're a way for us to keep in touch with people, for us to make connections. And that's that first layer of goodness in games, I believe. Um, the layer that everyone can see and is introduced to. Yeah, common connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, please continue. I was going to prompt you to continue, so. <laughs> <laughs> and going from that base layer, um, when we look at different industries, such as healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, specifically mental health, which is a field I'm very familiar with, um, there is a surprising application of that um, social influence aspect of games mm -hmm. um, that I think is so powerful. And the way that the world is going, in my opinion, we're embracing more and more technology. So it's not like we're ever going to reverse our course with our tech. It's we're going to go forward. And as our community in real life becomes more digital and more virtual focused, um, we have to start thinking about the systems and the ways that we are interacting with each other in these increasingly connected digital worlds. And I think games is something that exists that already handles this and that it will be applied on a more on a wider scale for that. Um, that. Yeah. So <laughs> I think investing in the social influence of games and how it can help is going to be really critical for us as a people moving forward in the future. That's beautiful. I think there's a lot of truth in what you just said. Um, I've been thinking about AI recently and speaking with many members of this community about AI. And I think mm. ultimately, regardless of what you believe, regardless of what you hope for AI, an undeniable truth is that much like most forms of technology, it is unstoppable. Um, mm -hmm. It is not something that we'll just be able to say, no, we're not going to do AI. Um, somebody somewhere is going to be continuing to develop and push it. Uh, yes. And so instead of trying to resist, I think it's more about trying to guide, which is a lot of what you are talking about here. Um, so why don't you give us our, our Gaming for Good 101? Let's say somebody is interested in um, working in Gaming for Good or perhaps applying it to their own projects or perhaps starting a new project that falls under this umbrella. What are some of your thoughts mm -hmm. on how somebody might get started in Gaming for Good? So... If I may, I'll give um, a little bit more context into why I'm interested in it to kind of illustrate how someone can do this, um, even in a really simple way. Yeah. Um, what I left out from my long convoluted origin story was um, <laughs> when I was really young, another job that I really loved doing because I was just an avid reader was writing. I love to write. And um, I even carry that with me um, just throughout my life. And even when I was considering that career in psychology, I was looking at alternative therapies like uh, narrative therapy, which involves stories, um, telling stories, writing your own stories, and and you know coming through healing through that. And um, don't get me started on this, but stories are one of our <laughs> oldest technologies, and they are so freaking cool. And mm. I was just so interested in how. Um, like art therapy and narrative therapy could be combined to really bring about a positive change in a person. And mm -hmm. so uh, being a lifelong gamer and kind of con combining these interests of mine with games and uh, writing, I was like, you know what? Even if, even if I just made one game that had a really cool story that spoke to someone or invited them to think about something, I think that would be a game for good. Um, and I say that because there's already, games have been doing this for a long time. I mean, games are stories, right? Um, mm -hmm. So games have been doing this for a long time where they tell these really impactful stories that you just get so caught up in. You have a really emotional response to it. Um, and it doesn't have to be marketed specifically as, oh, this is a, this is a game for good. No, I mean, <laughs> a, a good story is a good story. Those are timeless, you know? Um, so even at that level, um, you know, just considering the impact of your game and your story when you're creating, even at that level, I would say you could be making a game for good when your aim is to 
gift someone an experience that carries beyond the gaming experience. I think that's a, a very thoughtful act of game design um, that is like the building blocks for this. Um, I think that's really, and um, I think that's really beautiful. If I can throw something in here, I think it's for a beautiful sure. start. Like even if, even if we don't have hard rules, here is exactly how you do a game for good. Um, I think it's in my mind, largely a mindset shift, um, Mm. changing what you're building from simply a piece of entertainment, which by the way, first of all, I want to very clearly proclaim is totally cool. You can make games that Yes, are just absolutely. to make somebody, yeah, have a fun time. And that's great. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. um, but on the other end of that spectrum, I think, uh, thinking about it less as just something to make somebody happy or, or to give them a moment of fun, um, thinking of it instead as something that can enact actual change in a person's body, um, Mm. in mind is, is maybe a big part of the mindset difference. Um, Mm. we did a while ago now, maybe almost two years ago now, we did a, uh, what did we call a positive impact jam. We did a paid game jam where the top couple people made a couple of dollars. Um, and the whole idea was you have to make a game that somehow creates a positive impact or social good. And a lot of the games were very literal. Here's a game teaching you how to recycle. Here's a game that, um, or some of the other examples that like talk about sort of, uh, therapy techniques or like how to handle rejection. Um, and some of them were really cool, but ultimately the game that won, which was community voted, was just a cute little platformer about a dude dealing with his dark thoughts. Um, and it was just a Metroidvania, it was just a normal game, it didn't do anything, it's just a game. But the context was, I've got some dark thoughts, and I'm going to deal with them, and it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And I think, in my mind, that's a lot of how it would prompt people to think about games for good. Yes, there are literally games for doctors. Yes, there are Yes. literally games that teach you therapy. Um, and those are wonderful, but I think a lot of especially how the common game developer can approach this is that Mm-hmm. you're just... regular normal games make impact on people and having that mindset of i'm going to focus on having this be a positive impact where they leave better than when they started um is is maybe at least in my mind a big part of what it's about Absolutely. Yes. Very well said, Willem. Um, that's exactly it. It's a, I would like to say it's a low barrier to entry because um, I would love more people to uh, have this in mind when they're creating games. So just making it that simple to do it, I think is a, a really great way to open up to the public. Um, and it's the same way, you know, with my UX design background, you know, there's uh There's this uh, idea of being human-centered in our designs. So we want to focus on our the people who use our products, whether it's a game, whether it's a website, whatever it is. Um, you want to design with them in mind. And, um, oh, go ahead. No, please continue. <laughs> Yeah, so I like to, I mean, that kind of, that has a place in this as well. Um, because you, um, when it comes to, for example, the the winning game of that game jam, that's a very universal story. Um, Yeah. it appeals to a lot of people, and sometimes you can go very wide. You can cast a wide net and can get a lot of folks. Or sometimes you want to be more narrow and you want to focus to your specific audience, to your specific messaging, um, and that's kind of like the additional levels of games for good. Um, because as you climb higher. Um, there are different industries. I'll talk about uh, mental health care first. Um, that's one I know a lot about. So there are specific industries that are using games in a very specific way right now. Um, there are games right now being approved by the FDA, uh, the federal, the Food and Drug Administration, and they're being approved to be used as medicine. Um, as actual clinical treatment for people with uh, ADHD, for example. And there are games that are being used in mental health clinics across the country as part of biofeedback um, clinical treatments, which is where you, to help some patients, um, you want to help them kind of achieve a certain brain state, and you can train them using video games. Of course, they're hooked up to a bunch of electrodes on their head, but 
um, you're helping them um, kind of control and train their brain um, to emit a certain state. And you can do that with a fun game. Um, there's also games to help with phobias. I know arachnophobia is a really big one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's also fear of heights and uh, things like that. And there are also, I was a part of a study um, because I thought it was pretty neat where this uh, university was trying to see how the use of um, a VR game would help kind of offset pain for a patient. Mm. Um, so they administer some variable that's giving you pain, and then at the same time, they're having you um, in this VR world. It's a very beautiful, tranquil, underwater landscape. And they're just trying to measure, okay, so how does this help with a person who's experiencing pain? And for people who have chronic illness, you know, that could be something that could be a helpful treatment later on. Um, but anyways, th these are all these different ways that games are being used in healthcare for um, treatment for people. Um, but on that back end, there's also um, gaming simulations for healthcare providers. There are brain surgery sims for brain surgeons and so on and so forth. Mm. So That's these are, weird. oh, go ahead. I was basically just going to say that's really fascinating. <laughs> mm -hmm. It can become super specific and super, it can get overwhelming if you're like, oh, I want to go into that space, but I have to do this and I got to do that. You don't have to, but um, that's just showing you the diversity of options that are in healthcare alone. Um, another... Yeah, there's a oh, lot sorry. that we can. Um, absolutely. <laughs> We're stepping on each other's toes a little bit. That's all right, though. Um, there's a lot. I, I mean, I think it's... Uh, I hadn't heard of the phobia one, for instance. There's a lot that we can potentially do with games um, mm -hmm. that, once again, I, I like that we are... I like that you're giving us context that is quite literally a, a game for good. It is designed for a specific purpose, like getting you over a phobia. Mm -hmm. But I like mm -hmm. that you're also talking about using much more typical experiences, like, you know, being underwater in VR. I'm sure we've all played a couple of those for, for those who have played around with VR. Um, and, and that both of those can, can have a positive impact on us. Um, do you know who Ryan Douglas is in Deepwell? Oh my gosh, yes! I know yes. who Ryan is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Amazing. Um, we, yeah. We had him yes. on, a, on an episode of this a while ago, which I was trying to remember the name of the episode. So go look up Video Games as Medicine, Exploring the Power of Play. Um, it was a fantastic episode with Ryan. Um, and his, I was just going to mention a hit. Uh, you, you mentioned the flow state, basically. Um, mm -hmm. that once you get somebody into flow state, which games are really good at doing, mm -hmm. there's a, a real power of suggestion that you have over them. Um, and when asked for a specific example of how a game designer could implement that into a game, he mentioned... You get the player into flow state, you have them playing a really intense or uh, invigorated, connected moment of the game, and then you have their character take a deep breath. And that's mm. it. Um, and I love that. And you know, you literally have a sound effect of the character taking a deep breath. Like imagine you just had a big boss fight and you jump off a cliff and you land in some water, and then your character goes, <sighs> and, and how much of a moment that can actually be on the player and how much that can actually affect them. I thought that was a perfect example of the tidy ways that you as a developer can implement gaming for good. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That is very awesome. And I, um, I, I absolutely love that. I mean, because we have to remember the people playing our games are people. They mm -hmm. have stressors in their life. They're going through this and that. Games could be their escape. They could be their refuge. And so just those little thoughtful human designs. Um, can really make a big difference. Um, another topic that I'm very passionate about that intersects with technology and games specifically is climate change and inspiring climate action. So um, something that I'm currently interested in is how we can, how I could use games to promote education and awareness about climate change about our planet about taking about being a good steward of our planet and the people around us and um there is 
IGDA interest group for anyone who's also interested in games and climate change. It's called mm -hmm. the Climate SIG. Um, they have an active Discord, and they had a really cool summit at GDC. I hope they have another one. Um, <laughs> but it's filled with super awesome people. They have something called the uh, Game Developers Toolkit for Climate Change, I believe. Um, that was developed by um, one of the developers, I think he's at Ubisoft. Um, but they do a lot of really good talks and uh, resource sharing about this. And um, I'll try to share that with the community later so folks can check it out. Um, but they do a lot of really thoughtful work on this. And this is one way that I I try to think about with the games that I make or that I'm on the teams of. How can we add a little a little climate change messaging, a little something about just making you aware of it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because, uh, I mean, like I said earlier, stories, one of the oldest technologies we have, we use this to share important news when we didn't know how to write. Mm -hmm. We use this to carry our, our legacies, our stories, our warnings, the dangers. You know, stories were everything for us. And they still are. Uh, one of the number one things that has been proven to impact a person's decision making um, is their empathy. Did you appeal to them? Did you make it like personal for them? Um, that's how a person can make a decision. So when you wield that kind of power in stories for good, um, you can have a really big impact. Um, so that's that's what I'm interested in. And I think games has a really great um, opportunity here to do that for people. Yeah, I love that. I think there's a there's a lot of reasons that I love games. Um, there are so many beautiful forms of artistic media out there, including just auditory storytelling, which is, as you mm -hmm. say, something that's been around since the beginning of time, um, mm -hmm. since we first had language and probably before that, who knows? Um, and, and games, however, at this point in time, part of why I love them so much is because they're one of the only forms of media that involves player autonomy, player control, mm -hmm. rather than watching a story unfold, I am experiencing the stories and making the choices myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something that's a different, uh, a very different experience. Um, there's a, a fairly well-known way of thinking about game design, which is that it is asynchronous communication you're actually speaking to the player through your game. And you don't know when that's going to happen and you don't know what they're going to say back, but you're creating avenues for them to experience the conversation later. Um, and I think part of what you know we're talking about here is in that conversation, you have so much potential impact on the player, whether you're getting them into flow state and then affecting what they think about something or just giving them a chance to see something about climate activism or something along those lines. Um, and taking a moment to say, okay, what are the causes that I care about? And how can I deliver them in this game in a way that makes sense and fits this game? It doesn't compromise the quality of this game, but still delivers the message. I, I think that is in large part what I at least would hope people take away from this episode. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, for example, with the RPG genre in specific, I mean, the very act of having a player take the perspective of somebody else that maybe they normally wouldn't, mm -hmm. um, that it in itself is powerful too. Um, not only are they able to, especially those games, you can still kind of make your own choices as this different person, but you are somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, that forced perspective taking, it really invites a level of empathy and open-mindedness that some people don't, have an opportunity to kind of exert in their normal lives. Mm. And it opens up people to unique ways of seeing the world, um, unknown struggles that they didn't know people went through, right? Um, and it kind of starts this conversation in the person, like, oh, people live like this, or people experience this, or this is a way of being. Um, that kind of just, you know, the possibilities are really endless for where the conversations go internally with that. And um, as someone who was very interested in art therapy and narrative therapies and how they could be used um, in a, a therapeutic um, environment, 
I think that is the a real power of games. Um, there are groups of psychologists and counselors who I can also share with you who use D and D as a mm. way to kind of talk with uh, talk with their patients. Um, they use gaming in Minecraft together, even in Roblox um, for group therapy kind of sessions um, because it's. You know, you have some freedom. You're in this virtual world. You don't have to worry about looking at people. Um, you can share your story or you can be someone else. And through that person's story and through the choices they have to make, you can kind of explore some of your own stuff, too. Yeah, um, that, that's gorgeous. I think like <laughs> so. All right. The part of it where you get to connect and understand how another person thinks 100% mm. great, but where my mind went immediately is Knights of the Old Republic <laughs> being evil or mm. good, and how yeah. terrible I felt anytime wow. I was evil in any kind of way. Um, <laughs> you know, you get to, ex <laughs> you not only get to experience that, and, and it, some people I'm sure it's very healthy for them to like experience being the bad guy for a bit. Uh, mm. But I know at least for me, it was a real reinforcement of how much I want to help people actually. Um, mm. Like anytime I did anything bad and there was literal direct feedback from the air quotes here person that was disappointed or upset with me, like I felt. And and that was like, that was a great reminder of like, yeah, I don't want to be bad. <laughs> I want to be good to people. <laughs> I don't know if that's yeah. what they intended, but that's what I took away from it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So there is um there is one so one of the things that I taught when I was a master resilience trainer in the Air Force, um, there is this chapter that I taught about resilience where it was about um it was about a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And so a fixed mindset is where you're kind of stuck in your own ways, you're in this rut, you, you just do the same things over and over, you respond the same way to stimuli, even if it doesn't, you know, solve the problem or get you out of the problem. Um, a growth mindset is one where you are open to change, you're curious, you're kind of embracing new things, and you're just expanding your option set. Um, and in that lesson, there was a talk about your internal board of directors, and it's like everyone has their own stuff in their head. Mm -hmm. um, they have their own internal board of directors. So it's a group of people that sits at a, you can imagine like a conference room table in your head and they kind of influence the things you do. Um, maybe they're good influences, like they're people you really look up to, you really admire, people that you're like, oh, I wanna live like them. So I'm gonna kind of make choices so I can have a life like them or whatever. But you can also have those negative influences, like the bad side in KOTOR, of like, I don't want to don't harm revenant. people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can have a Revan at your table. Uh -huh, and you're uh -huh. like, you know what? This is a reminder of who I don't want to be. Mm. So you have a place at my table, but it's as an example of what I want to steer away from. Hmm. Um, and, oh my gosh, I'm getting so excited because um, media, uh, like games comic books, for example, these are really great ways, especially for children and people who are still kind of developing to see early examples of these things, especially if they don't have that in their personal lives, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have fictional characters in your board of directors who mm -hmm. maybe you really admire. For me, personally, I have my girl Storm and she Hulk on my <laughs> tables. Um, not only because they're... <laughs> Not only because they're awesome, um, but because they are beautifully complex and nuanced women. And despite having these amazing powers, they've also dealt with a lot of hard things. Um, there is a comic series from, I think it's a line from the late 80s or 90s, where Storm loses her powers completely. And she's super upset by this. Um, she's going through a lot. She's grieving. And um, she has this whole pity party and she goes through so much, but it's a very beautiful arc of coming out of that, not to demean the situation by saying pity party, but um, <laughs> she goes through a lot and she comes out on the other side better and she does get her powers back. Um, mm -hmm. But it takes her on a journey of self-exploration. She-Hulk also, um, there's a line recently where she became gray and she was going through a lot of grief and trauma. And she had to navigate that. And she had the help of her friends. 
Um, there's also a comic line called um, Heroes in Crisis. I think it's by Tom King, where it talks about different um, heroes and villains from DC that are, you know, the trauma that they've gone through, right? We see them as these super shiny heroes that they go through so much, they do a lot of damage, and they're fine. But no, they're not. There's something else that happens. And so that story kind of looks at everybody's story and um, how they cope. And so... Yeah, so creative media are way more important um, in that way for people. Um, they can be real, um, uh, real, real torches of inspiration. These characters that we create and the worlds that we that we build. So people can use these to navigate their own internal landscape when they may not have the words to articulate. Or they may not have a person to canvas these emotions onto. They can look at these fictional characters. I love that. There's so many good things in what you just said. I think the um, the mental exercise, by the way, of of having your sort of advisory council, um, mm. where I started with that, interestingly, was I thought of it as a, a captain and a crew. I'm the captain mm. of my ship, but there is a crew on that ship, and that crew has their own opinions, of course. Um, mm. And I think I, I have never thought of having crew members who are uh who are not in some way a positive role model um but mm -hmm. i think it's really beautiful and kind of interesting to be like actually i want voldemort on that ship because then i'll be <laughs> like yo let's not uh kill the mudbloods or <laughs> I don't know, whatever um i think that's really cool uh the other uh thing that i wanted to bring up here is just like so much of i think i think especially during that time period where i was uncertain about games mm. part of what stopped me is because these characters um, Gandalf is this huge inspiration for me, mm. are ultimately uh, not Gandalf. They are mm. um, Tolkien, right? Or they are yes. the writer for a various video game or whatever. But I think part oh. of what helped me reconnect to those characters is I do want to learn from Tolkien. And I do want to learn from that writer um, mm. and whoever else actually created these characters. Even if these characters aren't real, I'm still learning something. And if nothing else, I've been given a mirror for me to look at a certain aspect of my being um, mm. through that character's lens. Uh, mm -hmm. And so even though these are fictional characters, I think many of them have really wonderful things to teach us. You know, I will never give up because Monkey D. Luffy told me not to, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All right. I feel like we're in the really good stuff, but I want to make sure we've got some time for community questions. So I'm going to call yeah. John on stage. John's got a good question for you to start out with. John, okay. come on up and give us your question. Yeah, there, so, yeah, basically it's like, how do you make games that encourage a message through subtle, interactive ways without forcibly shoving down the obvious? Because what I noticed through some internet discourse is that it's too easy for amateur writers to shove down a message without going through the nuances or allowing room for the audience or the player to express their own opinions. If they're only mm. going to shove down a obvious message, it may turn to rejection. How do you try to make methods of do methods of subtle messaging that can encourage them to get a thought closer? Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a really good one. Um, and I, I've actually, I definitely have seen some of that internet discourse you're talking about. Um, so first, I would say that it kind of starts with what you are wanting to do with your game. Sometimes you have a very specific message that you're trying to get across. And so you want to just deliver that message uh, regardless. You don't want it to be an unpleasant experience, but you, you have a very specific thing you're trying to say, and that's fair. Um, so you can go that route. Um, but if you if you want if you're willing to be a little bit more um, nuanced and subtle, um, I'm a big fan of environmental storytelling. So using a combination of your level design and your art to kind of give snippets to this. Um, this isn't a game, but if you look at the game, uh, the movie Wall-E, I think it does a great job of kind of showing you the story of what mankind has done before you even understand what has fully happened. Um, and they do that by showing this environment that's towering with trash, this lone little robot that's kind of 
you know, rickety and on his own, just still making big old piles of trash. And he's all alone down there. Um, so I think that's one powerful way to do it. Another way is through some embedded storytelling elements. So for the player who is very curious and they want to know more information, then they are rewarded by that curiosity by having little Easter eggs here and there. Maybe there's a book they can pick up, a journal um, from somebody who had went through a climate crisis, for example, and they were a climate refugee. They had to travel from a place because their previous home was no longer hospitable. You know, um, something like that, that somebody can pick up and read or uh, they can find themselves if they're truly interested in pursuing more of that kind of storytelling. Um, yeah, those are those are some of the ways that come to the top of my mind. That so it sounds like rather than forcing, it's rewarding. It's like a it's like a positive versus negative um, uh, training mindset almost. Um, mm. And then it also sounds like. Um, making it about context as opposed to it being the central plot. Unless you're making a game for that to be the central plot, I think that's okay. It's just going to be for a particular kind of audience. Does that sound mm, about right? Absolutely, absolutely. Because, uh, for example, in Endling, Extinction is Forever, it's a very clear game about um, the destruction of a habitat, and mm -hmm. you're following this little fox family, and you know what the narrative is. It's very clear, but it's it's very well done to appeal to your emotion and the sense of family and the sense of loss. And, you know, it, it makes it universal in a way with that kind of a context. But it's still a very, very specific story that, you know, you cannot mistake what it's about. Yeah, for a particular audience. And there's going to be some people who don't play it, mm -hmm. um, which is mm -hmm. OK. Amazing. Absolutely. All right. Surya, do you want to come up on stage? Or do you want me to ask the question for you? Uh... Awesome. All right. We got Surya. Go ahead, Surya. Hey, Rochelle. Uh, really loving the episode so far. This is a good one. Oh, um, thank you. My question was that I noticed that gamers are often used to separating the in-game actions and emotions from the real lives. Like you play a shooter, but you don't you know, take a gun and go shoot real people. The gamers are trained to have the separation. So in your opinion, how does this affect the effectiveness of games for good in motivating real life, actual real life behavioral changes? Hmm. Um, can you rephrase the question for me? Sorry. Sure. So, so basically, if if I'm a player, if I'm playing a game for good, uh, I might you know relate to that character. I might see the message, and then I might come back to my daily life, and then just forget all about it because I'm as a gamer, oh. I'm used, not used to carrying my emotions in the game outside the game. I have a separation. How do hmm. games for good overcome that? Hmm. Well, uh, thank you. First of all, that's a really good one. Um, I don't have a really, I don't have a, like a one and done solution for this. But one of the thoughts that I just had when you were mentioning this was when you get back to the, the core of a game for good, um, it's not necessarily about really trying to achieve a specific super specific outcome it's just it's like an offering it's a gift to the world that you hope it can make an impact even for just a moment even if that moment is in the gameplay experience itself um i think if as long as you go into the design of your product with that the the person in mind i think you can't go wrong because you can't guarantee, oh, someone's going to think about this for the rest of their lives. There's no way to guarantee that. Um, but if you just invest in making a really good experience for your players, um, I mean, who knows what you can net out of that? Mm -hmm. But you'll definitely, there will definitely be some, uh, some kind of interplay between the player and the game. Maybe even if the player doesn't feel it afterwards or it doesn't last, there's still something in that magical moment when you are in that world. So sorry if that, that you know, might not be super satisfying, but uh, that one's a hard one to quantify. Yeah, I, mean, I think I, this was a really good answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Willem. Yeah, I mean, I was going to, I actually, I did the air clicks again. I didn't want to interrupt, but I was air clicking <laughs> during that response for Michelle. Um, Because I, I think very similar things about it, um, which is that it's ultimately not really your responsibility. 
Um, mm -hmm. Of course, you're trying to influence your audience. And of course, you're trying to deliver this message. But mm -hmm. I, I think there's two things that come to mind. Number one is you're not responsible for all of it. You're responsible for mm -hmm. your path on this earth and you're responsible to do your best. So mm -hmm. if somebody forgets about your message four months from now, like, well, you know, that's okay. Um, you you influence yeah. them for four months and hopefully something got in there deep that isn't going to leave. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the second thing is uh, actually comes to me from the coaching world, which is um, mm -hmm. when you do, there, there's a lot of different uh, a lot of different like exercises or ceremonies or whatever the heck you can do out there that sort of help pump you up and get you into the right mood to go kick butt or whatever. Um, and there's a common, uh, a common belief in the coaching world that you need to re-up every couple months. Every six months mm. or so, you have to go do something else that's going to pump you up again and get you back in the right mindset because nothing lasts forever. So I think expecting to create a game that's going to influence somebody's life forever is probably a fallacy that you just shouldn't pursue. And instead, mm -hmm. think about um, perhaps your game is the next six months for somebody, is the next cycle. Mm. Mm, that's wonderful. That is really wonderful. I'm snapping for you. Okay. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Same here. That's very, very quotable. Nice. Awesome. All right. Um, we've got, it, it is a little late, but it's a good, oh. Rochelle, are you down to talk for a couple more minutes here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. All right. I got uh, two more questions for you then. The first one I'm going to read for you, Alec. Uh, has a question but does not have a mic. Alex says, what's the most subtle, subversive, or surprising game for good you've found when contrasted against player action? When contrasted against player Alec, uh, action. Hi, Alec, by the way. Alec is on my team for our cohort in level three. <laughs> um, <laughs> hmm. So um, I, I guess this is asking what's like one of the most surprising ways a game made an impact on me that maybe it's a game that wasn't intending to do so. Um, so I am, I've never been a uh, FPS fan and that was only because I didn't think I was good enough. Like my hand-eye coordination was all over the place. A girl was struggling, but um, over the pandemic, I started playing through the Halo series and actually i super fell in love with halo <laughs> um <laughs> it was <laughs> it was very strange because i'm like i can't aim what's going on and now i'm just like oh i love this game <laughs> <laughs> um and i think what was surprising to me about the world of halo not only was it like the very interesting lore behind everything um, but I was really drawn into um, John uh, Master Chief's stoicism, and he just has this this demeanor where he's like, you know, I'm 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 here to get a job done. You know, when they call me, I'm about to I'm about to solve everything. You know, um, but that's kind of like it's it's kind of <laughs> um, he has this really nice play with Cortana who brings a softer, lighter side to him. And it's there's a lot of sentimentality between the two of them. And I, I was very surprised by that. And there was something about their relationship that I thought was really beautiful. And I've always been a fan of like duality in life and hmm. uh, nature. And that duality in Halo was very surprising for me. And it really pulled me in. And it just made me consider the duality in my own life. Um, there was times in my life where I felt like Master Chief, where I couldn't have emotions. I had to focus on getting the mission done, and I had to just work, work, work all the time, and not really focus on my personal self-care. Um, but just seeing him kind of soften up, just you know, here and there with Cortana, that was that was really beautiful. So I would say seeing that in an FPS. <laughs> with Space Marines was one of the most surprising uh, <laughs> uh, games Maybe for, the only... for me. <laughs> I love that. I feel like the only game that would be more surprising is like maybe something in the Warhammer 40k universe or like Gears of War or something. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm, like, cutting through an alien with a chainsaw, and I'm like, maybe I should think about my emotions. <laughs> uh, amazing. All right, final question of the day. DJ is up on stage. DJ, would you like to ask the last question? 
Okay, so since each player is different, even in specific target audience, what's the best way to connect the story with as many players as possible? Ah. Hmm. Well, I would say study the classics. Um, there's this phrase, I I'm probably going to botch it, but it's like, uh, great artist steal or something like that. And it's basically look at what stories have survived time and time again in human society. You can look at Shakespeare. Um, you can look at uh, fairy tales, mythologies from different cultures. Um, they tend to, they kind of have similar, um, similar structures and similar themes across them. And so do not underestimate the power of going to the library and researching fairy tales. Um, these are the stories that have kept people raptured in attention for centuries, thousands of years even. Um, even if you look at Gilgamesh, you know. So uh, if you're looking for like, or, or even for the more modern take, um, you can look at Pixar and Disney, what they're doing. There's a very famous um, story writing structure called the, the Pixar Pixar method um, hmm. on how to devise a story that that kind of fits this mold of being universal enough for people. Um, because if you notice with Disney movies, they're geared for children, but um, adults and their parents can enjoy them as well. Um, they have this secret sauce that's not so secret. Um, so I would really encourage to just research um, some of the stories that have just survived and see just look at the elements that keeps them going, right? Topics about loss, about love, about um, desire. You know, these are some of the core things that move us um, behaviorally as a species that we are um, invested in. Um, but when you look at the stories that we that we all tell, I mean, there's there's a little there's a crumb of truth in all of them. So, yeah, kind of kind of a little cheesy, but you know. I would really invite you to check out Disney Pixar movies. Look at the Pixar method for um, storytelling and also looking at fairy tales, mythologies, and Shakespeare. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, DJ. Fantastic answer. All right, Rochelle, we have come to the end of the episode. So before we say goodbye, mm. um, as always on this show, we'd like to ask for some homework. So what is something that an audience member who's listening can do in the next week or so to practice some of what you're talking about here today? Uh, well, two things. First, I would say start with yourself. Uh, maybe take some time to reflect on games that left a really big impact on you and why. Um, you don't have to write it down, but just th just think about it. What games stayed with you um, that you played? Was there a specific character? Was there a moment? Um, and then if you are a game dev yourself, which I assume most of you, all of you are, um, <laughs> maybe consider how you can bring some of that magic that got you hooked into what you're working on if it fits if it doesn't fit maybe save it for later but um you can just think about it you know um and just keep the player in mind when you're designing fantastic so for the homework for this week as always if you want i think it's good that if you just want to do this for yourself that's totally fine but if you're feeling like mm -hmm. sharing getting some community support Drop it in our Discord in the Great Hall channel um, using the hashtag IGLH homework, or drop that on LinkedIn and tag us at Indie Game Academy um, and tell us what are some of the games that left an impact on you and why. We'll have a little bit of a conversation there. All right, uh, it is time. Rochelle, are there any last messages you want to give the audience or anything you'd like to plug here at the end of the episode? <laughs> um, I just I just want to thank everybody for listening in. Um, please continue to enjoy the holidays and the rest, this resting time, if you can. And if you're interested in participating in any uh, research with Blizzard, um, there is a website that I can link you where you can sign up <laughs> to uh, potentially be contacted for playtesting opportunities. OK, thank you. Heck yeah, that's awesome. Give us the link, and we'll put it in the description down below. So if anybody's interested in that, um, absolutely check it out. All right, um, I actually want to read as the very, very last thing here. Uh, a comment from Alec about you, Rochelle. <laughs> oh, um, this is both to give you a little pat on the back. And also, I think it's a great summary of what we talked about today. So Alec says, Rochelle, along with my other teammates, have shown me that we can aim for a game for good without compromising entertainment value. 
No question, just public appreciation. Aww, Fantastic. That's, that's so sweet. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> I'm so glad y'all are getting along. That's like the best thing in the world. All right. It is time to say goodbye. Rochelle, thank you for being here. This has been a fantastic episode. I've really enjoyed talking about this with you. Mm, thank you so much, Willem. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for those who are in the audience listening. I love having you here live. It's wonderful to watch the chat. You always make me giggle. Uh, somebody told me that I got kicked out of Halo because my older brother pulled the power cord on me because he was sick of me playing games. <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> oh, no. Um, <laughs> who knows? Um, thank you for those who have listened here today and those who asked questions. It always take a little bravery to get up on stage, so thank you for doing that. Um, and for those who are listening after the fact on the actual recording, thank you for listening. And if you enjoy this episode, as always, we ask that you send it along to just one other person. Who is it? somebody else in your life that you think could hear uh, some great lessons from Michelle and who would benefit from it? Send it along to them for us. All right, that's going to be it. We'll be here again Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, every Wednesday, forever. Uh, probably, maybe, probably not actually, forever's a long time, <laughs> but at least next week we'll be here, 12 p.m. Eastern time. There's links to join down below. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.